So now we'll look at the booting up of the actual desk. So at the back, you would press the on switch, which is directly above the power supply. The desk would then boot up in this following procedure. And then what, what you can also do as well is while that's booting up, you can also put the screens on. That would just show you at the minute, it would just show you the Xerox loading screen. But it would also show you what is currently happening with the desk, as in the actual what's loading and things such as that. So this is the desk actually booted up. As I said before, you have your primary and secondary display. So this is the story. And in here we store many things which can be lighting equipment, sound equipment and also consumables. So here you see we have our box of so 13 amp extension leads and then we use these for general powering for when we're down on stage for LEDs. We have an array of lights rigged on the bar and also on the floor. We have Parkan 64s, my new uh, mini Fresnels. Some more mini fresnels, a big fresnel, an IDB. We've got some par 64 short nose. We've got some more 64s long nose. We've then got some LED park hands and another one. We've got a, a profile spot, but a more older version, which we don't normally use that much. We've got some profile spots. This is a junior. We've then got a ETC source for Zoom, which is the daddy of the family, as the junior is the child, if you say. We've got some more profiles, another profile spot, and then what we like to use quite often is our UV cannon, a projector, and then our favourite lights in here, which are our Rode Colour Spots 250s. Then, third term, we have a big box of 15 amp extensions which we use for stage lighting so all the lights you saw down there will connect up to these and these then can go into the patch bay. We then have three dimmer racks here. Each dimmer rack has a certain set a certain amount of numbers which correspond to the plugs on the patch on the fly tower and also on stage. So one to twenty four for example on there and then that's the same for the next two. Then next, we have a trunk which is full of sound equipment. So at the minute we've got things like mics in here, we've got cables for lapel, microphones, we've got shore lapel mics and Sennheisers. We then have a head mic along with two Sennheisers microphones, high quality. Under here we have another, another lighting desk, which was our old one, and that was the Chester GXL Extra. We don't use that no more because we have an orb, which you saw earlier. And this is another lighting desk which was brought from Mons, which we don't use, but it's always good to keep for these things in case we need to use them. High vis jackets for health and safety. And then this is the consumables. So we're in the storeroom and in here we have our consumables which could involve things like bulbs, various pieces for um, G clamps, safety bonds and whatnot. This is the actual consumables here. Um, I've just laid out a few things on the flight case here that we would put in there. So to start off with, we've got things like frames which you'd put in there. These are frames for gels that you would put within lighting. So for example, I've got a park hand in here. Um, and as you can see, the frame just slots into the front of the park and that's where you will put your jet. All lights vary, all lights will vary in their frame sizes. So for example, that's for a profile junior, whereas that's for a profile um, ETC zoom. So there's a distinct difference within sizes of your frame. 
There's also things like barn doors, which you can put on lights. This, the reason why barn doors aren't permanently fixed to lighting is because sometimes you don't want the barn doors on there. And you may want them to be a free-flowing beam. So these are very good for things like fresnels or minute fresnels. Anything where it gives a wash on stage and you might need to cut it off at a certain point. We then also have quite useful tool, which is a multi-tool which gives us the ability to do things where we need to either tighten things up or grab things. And then in here there's like things like a knife we can you can kind of just see there if we need to cut anything and there's more equipment things over here. Then we have quite a use another quite useful tool which we use most often which is a colour uh, a colour swatch which is basically all the different filters that we have in gel wise are all in here. So if I want a blue, I would just find the right blue in the right tint and then on there it tells you what the name of it is, the the transmission, um, which is how much light it actually lets through, the um, the gel, and then you also have an identify identity identity number which you put onto the gel so you know that 142 is the blue that I've just shown you there. And then also you've got a graph which shows you the different variations of what frequencies it's cutting off and what it's not. We then have example of gels is here. We have a magenta, a yellow, and then a blue. The blue one you can the blue one is for a par can that's cut to the size of a par can. And you can tell by looking at both that even though the flood and par can are different lights and they do different things. There's a distinct kind of pattern in the fact that it's mostly squares or rectangles. There's not many times when you need to cut kind of circular gels or anything like that. And I'll go in a bit later of how to put a gel into a light, but I'll carry on for now. Then we have safety chains. The reason why this is a safety chain is because it's a chain and it's used to secure the light to the bar. So if the G clamp was to fail, which is this, then this will catch the light and hold it from falling onto an audience member or performers or on stage. There's two types, there's the chain which I've just shown you there, but there's also a bond which is steel, metal, um, round together, which is stronger than the chain. So for a, for example, a park and light would take this safety chain, whereas a profile or a flood would take one of these safety bonds because these can hold more weight and these are stronger. Then we have another piece of equipment that we uh, accessory that we use in lights, which is a gobo a gobo holder. And um, this is for I believe a profile spot. And um, and then you ha have your actual gobos here, which is basically a stencil cutout of the gobo which you would just slot in to the frame and then that would just slot into your light and then you're away. Then we have in the kitchen balls as well is our bulbs because our bulbs do quite go quite often. So for this bulb you're using things like profile spots, lights that will take 240 volts and then this is a 240 volt again but this is for a parkan and this is a 1000 watt kilowatt bulb um, and this the reason why this is bigger is because with a parkan you need more so you can kind of see it in there with a parkan it needs to output more light one last thing is a little box that we always have which is full of things like fuses for things like our intelligent lighting which takes fuses because that runs on a 13 amp. We've got things like nuts and bolts for securing G clamps and other things like that. Some more fuses and some hooks. Now that's the consumer balls. So we're here at the winches and I'm going to show you how you would rig a light now. So for example I've got a par cam here which is a par 64. 
And one thing that we always do before we rig the light is we make sure it has either a safety chain or safety bond on the lantern. So if this G comes here with the fail, then that safety device is there to catch it so it doesn't fall on you. So the first step is to actually place it on the bar. And then you want to tighten it so that it can't move. Like so. And then you want to put the safety chain around the yoke on the lantern as it is there. And then around the bar so it clips in like that. So now if that, lamp, if that G clamp was to fail, we know that it's safety because this is going to catch it, the safety chain. So we'll go on the other side now where I'll plug it in and show you how you would find the patch for this lamp. So we're now on this side of the winch bar, which is where we have all of our plugs that we plug our lanterns into. And as, as I said before, these go to a multi-core cable, which then goes up to the flight tower. And then that goes into another, that gets transferred back into 12 individual plugs, which get put into the patch. So we want to get the plug of the lantern that we're patching in. And we want to make sure that the cable isn't hanging like that, so as that it could burn on the light. We want to make sure that it's still got a bit of slack so you can move it around, but that it's not close to the lantern at all, because these power cans can get very hot if they're on for long periods of time. And then when we've plugged it in, we want to look at the number underneath. And all of the plugs on here have a number from one to six, so there's two sets of six on here. And then we want to look at the letter of the multi-core cable at the end of the bar here, which is E. So our patch for that lantern will be E5, and then our channel would be whatever we plug it in up there, which, for example, we might do is 25. So here we are on the fly tower. This is where we have all of our patch connections and also where we control our automated winches from. So as you can see here, we have four multi-core cables which go down to each winch down there. If you want to take a quick look. These four multi-core cables are useful because they combine all of the 12 plugs on the bar into one cable which then gets transferred and converted back into 12 separate plugs up here. So, for example, I'm now going to patch in a light on E1. So first I need to look for the corresponding letter. So it's E. Once I know that I've got the correct multi-core by the letter, which corresponds with the winch down there, I then want to look for the number that I'm looking for. So I'm looking for one, and here's one here. And you know that because there's a little identify, identity tag little on there. And then I have a range of plugs I can plug it into. An important thing with patching is you must always note down where, the, where you are putting the patch. So a table would have two columns, a patch and a channel. Your patch would be the letter and the number of the multi-core and plug cable. Your channel would be where it, where it goes in the patch bay. So for example I'll plug this in 25 just to demonstrate. So my patch would now be that E1 is 25. So if there was an issue with the plug with 25 on the desk I know that I need to look at E1 on the ridge bar. We have three full size patch. We then have one smaller patch which we mainly use for things like floods. We don't really use this for for, for park hands or anything like that. This is normally for floods simply because these plugs are all joined together so that these two work together, these two work together and so forth. As does on the other three patch bays down there. And now we've come to the gallery where I'm going to show you how you focus it. If you look at the spot as it is now you can see that it's So the way we focus this is there's 
this part here and this has two um, lenses and the way that you do is if I, if I turn this the spot will get smaller and if I turn it the other way the spot will get bigger and the numbers here the numbers on the light here tell you what the radius is so at the minute it's at 30 and then as I bring the lens as I bring the lens further away from the light it gets smaller and smaller until it gets to 15. If I then want to make that a crisp sharp in focus because at the minute it's not completely in focus is I pull it towards me and then that will pull it in focus and I lock it down with that. So, so if I just repeat that you'll actually see what's happening. See how it's now gone in crisp in focus and if I just make sure that all of the cutters are out that's now a crisp spot. If I want to make this out of focus, very much out of focus, you want to make it as big as possible, so that would be its limit at 30. And then by moving it in, focus, out focus, in and out. Then also, we're going to want to cut the light sometimes, because it may be spilling onto set pieces, or if we're doing a kind of conference scenario, it would spill onto the curtain and then onto the projection. So, on near the near the bulb, this is the bulb housing. This is where the bulb actually is placed, and then this is where you've got your lenses and your cutters. So these are your cutters here, four metal pieces of metal, which when you push them in basically blocks off the light from exiting the lantern. So with this you could actually create certain shapes, so for example you've got a square, you could create a rectangle, or possibly maybe a corridor. If you was doing that kind of C, you could make a kind of corridor effect. And then, obviously, to return this to its normal, you just pull them all back out, and that would be back to its normal spot. Okay, so I was going to show you how you would actually insert a gel within to a lantern. Um, so, for example, we've got two lanterns here. We've got the profile, which is the smaller frame that I showed you up there. And then we've also got a park hand next to it, which is what we're going to insert the gel into. So at the minute, you see that it doesn't have a frame at the minute, but I've prepared one earlier. Now, this frame is very robust in that they don't break easily. It is basically just a piece of metal, which is shaped and cut into a circle, and then you've got the frame itself. Next to me here, I have a gel. And as you can see, this is actually labelled 079 or 099. That tells me that if I was to go into the colour swatch and was to look up the identify, num identify number 099, it would tell me what this is, what the name is, what the transmission bit is. So to put it in, it's as simple as you place it within this and you slot it down. Now it is quite awkward to actually get it to go in, but if you just pull it apart a bit, it does go in like that. So now, that's the first part, but now we need to actually put it onto the light. So to do that, you've got four metal kind of hooks, or kind of that it slides into. There's one which is sprunged at the front, that's the one that, the clip, that's the one that clips in onto the front. So, if we take this and we slide it in, like so, and then clip it in. So now that, that won't fall out of there, because if I was just to tilt this off, for you to get a better view of the clip, you can see that that clip that is holding it in is spring-loaded, so that's 
it's not going to fall out. Obviously, we that's the same process along all of the lights we have. So I don't have no gels with me at the moment for profiles, but if I just grab a flood, you can see the minute this has got a red jelly. So if I wanted to remove a gel, so I've just put one in, but if I wanted to do the opposite of that, on a flood you'd lift up this little spring-loaded flap. That basically is stopping that from falling out. You pull out the frame, and then the gel wasn't actually placed in there properly because as you can see, it's not even correctly placed. But normally you would open these and you would slide it out. One thing to remember with a gel is they do get hot and eventually after so after their lifetime they will burn and basically a hole will emerge after so long. So it's always good to check gels after so long. Find the ones that are burnt or damaged that can't be reused and throw them away. Um, and then to put this back in the, the flood, you find the groove that's in the top of the flood and just slide it in. And click it back over, like 